We've got a housing crisis. Affordable housing is a big issue in Toronto. How do people afford homes? How do people, how does the interest rate impact folks, especially developers? We're here with Housing Now TO, Mark Richardson, who's going to give us the lowdown on what we can do to get housing now. All right, Mark, we're getting in focus about Housing Now TO. So you've been a force to reckon with, with affordable housing. And I'd love you to talk a little bit about your key initiatives. How did Housing Now TO come to be? Well, almost five years ago, John Tory announced the uh, Housing Now program with 11 sites, uh, surplus city sites, mostly at TTC parking lots around the city of Toronto. And we were uh, coming from the open data, open government and transparency world. And we really wanted to try and put them into a practical use. So yeah. we said, okay, we'll start tracking those 11 sites and see what happens on them. Do they move? Do they proceed? How, where do they get stuck in city hall? Um, and it started out as a little side of our desk project for a bunch of civic tech nerds and has grown into something with a lot more impact, um, because our numbers and our approach to it, we're, we're kind of like a personal trainer. You know, you set a target that you want to lose some weight or you want to run a marathon or something. Yeah. You need to get your reps in every week. You need to eat better. You need to sleep better. You need to change your day-to-day -day habits. Yeah. And we were pretty sure that when the Housing Now targets were set in 2018, 2019, the city wasn't ready to change its day-to-day -day habits to deliver on them. Okay. So how did you hold them accountable? Just by tracking them. Did you, uh, the same way you would a diet or an exercise plan. Yeah. Are you doing the things every day, every week that will help you get to the, um, the, the targets that you've set for yourself? And, and that's a big part of like, when you talk about being a nerd, the data, the analytics help prove, right? And help demonstrate and showcase what's being done, what isn't being done. Yeah, I mean, it was almost funny. The December 29, uh, 2018, uh, John Tory released this Housing Now plan with the first 11 sites. And there's the city releases one black and white spreadsheet with like 11 addresses and a couple of rows of columns. Yeah. There's no photos, there's no maps, there's no details about any of those sites put easily into the public domain. So that's how we started. We started by spending about eight weeks going to all the sites, photographing them, taking drone photos, other stuff, uh, digging through all the city files on what was the history of these sites and then putting them into a Google map. Right. Uh, and that Google map launched at to the end of January of 2019. We've now passed 170,000 visitors to that Google map over the wow. last five years. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, the driving force about housing affordability is the people. Like, people yeah. need houses. Because without housing security, like, I believe our city falls apart. Lives fall apart. Well, and it's also the opportunity cost of, yeah. of housing. I came to Toronto 30 years ago, right out of school. Uh, I drove a beat up station wagon across the country from Alberta. I got a retail job. I was able to rent a basement apartment in a nice part of Cabbage Town for $600 a month inclusive yeah. of everything except my Rogers and my Bell bill, <laughs> right? Right. Back in the day when you had landline and cable. Yeah. Um, today that should be about 950 if you just in, indexed it for inflation to what I paid in 1993. That's and if you go and look at that same unit, now it's 2300 bucks. Yeah. So where does a person like me arriving in Toronto, be they arriving from Alberta or Albania or Addis Ababa, you yeah. know, anywhere in the world, if they arrive in Toronto, where do they get that opportunity to start a life? Yeah. Um, how do we get it so that students who go to our universities are able to stay here? And, you know, my, my niece went to nursing school. Uh, she's an intensive care nurse. And it was easier for her and her husband to start their life in Hamilton than start their life in Toronto because they could afford to have a house, have a child, start a family yeah. there because they, they could afford it in, in Hamilton. They couldn't afford it in Toronto. She's not going to get on a go train and commute 90 minutes yeah. to get to a downtown hospital. She's going to instead be in Hamilton working in one of their hospitals. Yeah. So and we're going we're gonna to lose that, that cohort, that generation, if we don't we create are. housing. Yeah, we are, 100%. Like we're already losing that. And I mean, people are moving to where they can afford it. And you hear about international students who land here and they're like, nope, can't afford it. Headed out yep. to another part of the country. Um, 
So let's talk about like the like top three things Housing Now TO is focused on. I mean, the main thing is surplus government lands at all three levels of government. Uh, so the city, municipal and federal. So big federal sites like some of the lands around the Downsview Park go stations. Mm -hmm. um, provincially, we're really trying to get access to the go station uh, parking lots in places like Scarborough. And there are you know, thousands and thousands of units being created on uh, the provincial sites along the Ontario line. Yeah. And at the moment, neither the, the province or the feds actually have a mechanism to require affordable housing legislatively when they get rid of those sites. Whereas the city of Toronto, through the Housing Now program, does 99 year land lease. And one of the conditions of the land lease is that one third of the units are in an affordable rental band for 99 years. So there, there's a mechanism there the city has, has created that we're encouraging the other levels of government to adopt something similar. And I know you've been like crisscrossing the country yep. advocating for this. I mean, you were recently in Ottawa. Yeah. And what were you advocating for? The weirdest phone call I ever got was like... Thursday at four o'clock, can you come and speak to the Federal Finance Committee as an expert witness on Monday morning? Yeah. Um, and what's crazy is we're volunteers. We're doing it off the side of our desk. There are thousands of people who work in CMHC. There are yeah. thousands of people who work in the Federal Finance Commission. Uh, there are thousands of people who work at Stats Canada. Why is it that we as an outside open data government transparency organization are being asked to come in and answer a question like, what is the HST rebate worth on an affordable housing project? Yeah. And I think part of that is there's probably staff in all of those organizations that know the number, but we are able to speak clearly and frankly about it in a way that doesn't have to make the politicians happy. It just kind of lays the facts out on the table. And I don't think there's an incentive any more in government for serious civil servants and bureaucrats to give free, frank, public-facing advice. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of the challenge, that we're come being brought in as an organization and we're being asked to answer questions that should be at the fingertips of the prime minister and the finance minister and the housing minister already. Yeah. And if they're not, then that's a, a problem within the way we're structured. Yeah. Um, so we've had we've had a you know a good experience. We've spoken to the uh, new provincial uh, housing minister uh, and his staff. We've spoken to uh, the new federal housing minister. Uh, we're really happy. In fact, that the, the recent change, the housing minister is now the minister of housing and infrastructure. Yeah. So you know another thing we'd like to underline is that. In cities, affordable housing is infrastructure. Yeah. You have to have houses that nurses and teachers and Tim Hortons workers and TTC bus operators can afford to live in. Yeah. You can't have people who have to commute in 90 minutes or two hours to provide those essential services within your communities. Um, so infrastructure is not just bridges and tunnels and subways. And, and water pipes, it is also creating an appropriate amount of affordable housing to house the the workers that you need in your in your city. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think you're doing great work, but I know it's not without its challenges. What are some of the challenges that you're experiencing? Data quality. Okay. Um, so, you know, here in Ontario, the fact that MPAC, which is Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, their data is in a black box that you can't really get to. Um, the um, GeoWeb TerraNet, which is the, the, the land title system. Um, I go to somewhere like BC and I can pull up all of the assessment information and the property ownership information for any property in British Columbia on a public website. Okay. Um, in the city of Toronto, and in fact, in the entire province of Ontario, all of that is hidden behind third party firewalls because they consider that a, a way to generate revenue for the government or you know, fund their operations. Right. And knowledge is power. Putting that information into the public domain is of benefit 
to the public. Yeah. Um, yes, I should know what you pay for your property taxes. Yes, I should know what your house is assessed at. Yes, I should know what this parcel of land is and how long it's been owned and who owns it. Yeah. Even if I'm just looking for government sites. Yeah. Am I looking for the LCBO? Am I looking for Metrolinks? Am I looking for the RCMP? Am yeah. I looking for Parks Canada? Like our ability to uh, navigate that data in some provinces is excellent in other provinces is terrible. Ontario is kind of in the middle range. Right. Okay. You know, BC is fantastic. Alberta is terrible. Right. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of like current initiatives that you're working on. Yep. What, what is it? it? Essentially now we're working on three projects uh, with the two of them at U of T School of Cities with the multidisciplinary urban capstone students. Yeah. And then another one at Toronto Metropolitan University with the School of Urban and Regional Planning. Uh, this is our eighth or ninth program we've done with those schools. And what we do is every year we take surplus government owned lands that we know are somewhere in the housing now or the affordable housing pipeline. And we have the students work both the math of the project and the design of the project. So you can design the nicest building you want as an affordable housing building. But if the math doesn't work for the programs that CMHC offers, it's never going to get built. I love it. I mean, I think that's a very tactile way of engagement, of having a real site, having like real time analysis with these students of like, how do we create spaces that are affordable, that meet the needs of the users? And we also have students who are now going out to work in industry or in government who understand the real world challenges of affordable housing. Yeah. You've got to remember that since the mid 80s, I guess, mid 90s, maybe yeah. we stopped creating much yeah. affordable housing. So that generation of people who was around in both in government yeah. and in the not for profits and in the private sector, a lot of them have either retired or passed away. Yeah, it's so true. So we need to create a new generation of of workers and of experts who are going to be able to do the next 30 years of affordable housing development in Toronto and around Ontario. Uh, we've already had students who have been hired into counselor's offices after working on our projects at City Hall. We've had students who have been hired into different government organizations and into private developers. And in the private developers, they are being asked to work on projects that have an affordable housing component in them so that they can help make that math work. I think that's so important because we do need that knowledge being applied. And I mean... I'm in real estate. So one of the things that we hear is the costs, right? Yep. The, the development charges, the interest rates, the labor, the cost of materials. I mean, how, you know, we, we, we live in a city where we have a housing affordability crisis. We don't have enough units and there's such a demand. What are you seeing from your lens? So we can pretty much look at 10 years ago to today. So in 2012, 2013, the city of Toronto finished a Toronto community housing building in city place on Dan Lecky. I think it's 140 Dan yeah. Lecky. Um, there's a Tim Hortons sort of in the podium and on the yeah. corner there. Um, when that building was completed, on average, a unit cost at development was about $240,000 a door for them to develop that project. Today, the mayor has just announced her new plan for 65,000 units. Um, it's a $36 billion program, and that works out to $560,000 a door. So over a decade, just the cost of developing the unit, this is not the land cost. Yeah. This is the straight development cost has doubled. It would have been great if we'd have been building a lot more housing at two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars a door or two hundred and forty thousand dollars a door. Now we're having to try and build stuff at half a million dollars a door. Yeah, how many square feet is that? Do you think on average um, it's about six hundred square feet for an yeah. average size unit? You go from about about four fifty for a studio one bedroom mm -hmm. up to like the biggest three bedrooms you'll see non accessible are about 980. Yeah. If you do the accessible bathrooms and the accessible kitchens, that takes you up to about 1100. Wow. Um, one of the, so part of that is because of changes the city made to its own design guidelines yeah. to towers in 2013. Um, but another part of it is, you know, 
those big buildings we used to build in the 70s that you see all around the city of Toronto with those huge floor plates. Yeah. And they've only been 20 stories tall, yeah. but they were blocks. They took up like half a block. So and you would have 15, 1600 square foot, three bedrooms. Yeah, You're never getting those back again no. if you don't make substantial changes to the rules that govern the kinds of buildings you can build in Toronto. It's so interesting. Oh, I'm just trying to think who I was talking to about this, but a lot of the bylaws prevent like yeah. smart, like, I don't want to say smart, but you know, you can say smart. <laughs> no, you, honestly, you can't say smart. We, we, we spent 30 years at the city of Toronto creating rules to restrain private sector developers And we never considered that we might want to get back into the development business again. So we never put at City Hall into those rules, this rule does not apply if it's an affordable housing project. Yeah. We said it applies to everybody. And now we're in a situation where rather than fighting off evil mustache twirling developers, City Hall and Olivia Chow want to get into the mustache twirling developer business. Yeah. And they've laid a series of landmines in front of themselves and roadblocks in front of themselves over the last 30 years that now need to be bypassed. Yeah. So what conversations are being had to do this? For example, the rapid housing. So during COVID, there were some hotel conversions yeah. and then there were also the modular housing sites. Yeah. Every one of those needed a minister's zoning order because they didn't meet the the zoning requirements for that neighborhood. But we took a site that was uh, near Vic Park Station and another one um, on the Dover Court, and it went from a field, like empty field, to people living in that site in eight months. From wow. April, it was announced to December, they moved in. December, January, they moved in. Um, there was an urgency, and it was yeah. covid And people were willing to say, the rules don't matter. We need to get this done. The feds were pouring money on yeah. it as well because the rapid housing initiative came out. And it was, you had to, if you took the money, you had to have people moved in within 12 months. Yeah. Now it's 18 months. It's still good yeah. that it forces municipalities to break their own rules to deliver within a certain period of time. No, and, and this is the thing. I think a lot of people were like, wait a minute, how is there all these studies coming out? How are all these things that was going to take years and years all of a sudden happening in a very fast cycle? And I think and it, where there's it upset, a will. It upset people as yeah. well, right? You know, we had people protesting about loss of the parking lot, which was going to be the heart of the community in yeah. East York. We totally had that one, um, yeah. And that is something that... The city was fine-tuned for 30 years to listen to the angriest neighbor. Yeah. And the angriest neighbor doesn't have the broader vision of the city as part of their set of priorities. Yeah. They care about their backyard. They care about their view. They care about the shadow. They care about parking. They care a lot about parking. I mean, we fought for years now about parking minimums, and it was actually... The, the impact of parking minimums on killing affordable housing projects yeah. was part of how we managed to convince the city to kill parking minimums citywide. Right. Wow. That's um, a big feat. Well, so, th so there's a, a great story. Um, 355 Coxwell Avenue, Coxwell and Upper Girard. It's a little strip mall, 2016, a not-for-profit co-op buys it. And they want to turn it into six stories of seniors' affordable housing, 32 units. At that time, by default, the bylaw said that if you want to build 32 units of seniors' co-op affordable housing on a streetcar line, you will need 41 underground parking spaces. Okay. You needed like 1.2 for every unit plus like six visitor spaces or okay. something like that. Um That would have been in 2016, 2017 $3 million dollars of underground parking before you built a single unit of affordable housing. Oh my goodness. And that was the default bylaw that was on the books because we'd put these parking requirements in to make it harder on private sector developers and we'd never put it into those rules. This doesn't apply if you're an affordable housing project. Yeah. Um, And, you know, whether it was sensible to put those rules in to stop affordable housing developers, stop regular for-profit housing developers is a different question. 
I think they were really put there as rules that we were okay with haggling away during the negotiation process with city planning and the councillors. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we'd never thought we should put a ground rule in that says all of these policies don't apply if you're building affordable housing, affordable housing, do what you need to do. Can the super mayor power be used to yes. change this? Yes, to a degree it could. <laughs> to a degree, it, uh, it's certainly uh, the super mayor power. My understanding is that um, Greg Lintern, who's the current chief planner, is retiring at the end yeah. of this year. Um, so there'll be a replacement for Greg Lintern. And the hiring process will be at the discretion of our super mayor, Olivia Chow. So the choice of who she chooses as chief planner um, will be a real acid test because she's now set 65,000 units by 2030 as her target. Yeah. 6,500 of those as rent geared to income, which is yeah. an incredibly low cost unit. Yeah. Um, and she's essentially got six and a, half, a bit years to do that. Um, so I think it's who, who our next chief planner is will be a real acid test for how serious the city is about delivering on its own housing targets that has just passed. No, and I think those are factors where most people don't even know why that's important, right? And and the shape of our future as a city is going to be really impacted by the leaders that are in place and who's, who is overseeing the planning process. Well, who is not overseeing? I don't need an overseer. Yeah, yeah. I need somebody who is streamlining the planning process. Yeah. I need somebody yeah. who is saying the thing that used to take 25 steps now needs to take five steps. Yeah. yeah. And those five steps need to be completed within nine months. Yeah. Like in, in some other municipalities, they, if an affordable housing project comes in in Ontario, if this, they circulate it amongst all the staff, the planning, the transportation, the mm -hmm. parks and rec, everybody needs to take a look at it to see if there's an impact. In other municipalities, if the staff do not respond from the individual departments within, I think it's 45 days, they assume silence is consent. Mm. Whereas the city of Toronto, we have this sort of manana machine, which says we'll wait until everybody has put their comments in, no matter how long their comments take. Oh, okay. So we've, we've built a system that is designed to default to no and go slow. Mm. And now we have a city council with a 25 to one vote who said we want to do things at a speed and scale. We haven't done things in yeah. 30 years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, sort of back to the idea of a new year's resolution and, you know, you're going to lose weight or run a marathon. It's, are you going to get off the sofa? Are you going to stop eating the cheesies? Yeah. Are you going to go and get your, your runs in every day? Are yeah. you going to go to the gym t three times a week? Um, you need to change your day-to-day -day habits and your day-to-day -day behavior. Yeah. But a lot of politicians are actually voted in by a base of supporters who are very happy with the no and go slow process yeah. where every neighbor gets to chip in about yeah. every development. And that's what we hear, like, not in my backyard, right? The nimbyism yeah. that happens. And it is a serious force. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? If only I had a dollar... For every time somebody says, I really support affordable housing, but. Not in my backyard. Well, not, in, but whatever the but is, whether it's yeah. their backyard, whether it's parking, yeah. whether it's, I want to know who's going to be living in these units. Like there's a grocery list of yeah. things, but everybody, nobody says, nobody wants to say they're against affordable housing. Everybody supports theoretical affordable housing. Yeah. It's when the actual affordable housing project is within a couple of hundred meters of where you live that that support either evaporates or becomes so fractious in the neighborhood. We've had people who are like, I do support this project. I really want to come out in support of it. I'll send a letter in anonymously. But if I send a letter in publicly or I speak up at a public meeting, my kids won't get invited to the birthday parties and the hockey games in the neighborhood anymore. It is, it's like the worst person in your neighborhood yeah. sets the tone for the neighborhood's response because everyone's afraid of standing up to Cranky Bob at the end of the block. Yeah. I mean, this comes down to the courage to stand up. Yeah. And, and there's more people who actually support it generally in a neighborhood than are against it. Okay. But the people who come out against it tend to be the loudest, grumpiest, the kind of people, you know, who 
you you don't want to sort of get on the wrong side of within your local community. Right. What have you seen as ways to address that? That we remove some of the ability to oppose. Okay. So um, Ontario Land Tribunal, yeah. it only costs $400 to file an appeal at the Ontario Land Tribunal for a community group or a neighbor. Okay. So we've had, there's a, you know, we've had an appeal against the modular housing site in Willowdale on Cummer Avenue. Uh, that's two years. It's been tied up. Wow. Um, we had another appeal against a housing now site, which is right next to the Scarborough Civic Center. Um, that is going to be like about 600 units, I think, in total, 250. 20, 230 of them affordable. Right. Um, right near where the new Scarborough subway is going through. Yeah. One neighbor in a nearby condo building spent the $400. The hearing for it was last year, and we received a verbal ruling at the hearing to say that this neighbor's appeal has no merit and the project should proceed as planned by the city. After a two-year wait. After, after a, at least a year's wait. Okay. But... We're now waiting, it's 13 months later, we're still waiting on the written decision from the Ontario Land Tribunal. And until you get the written decision, the city can't proceed because you can't proceed on a verbal approval. Yeah. So help me understand why there's a 13 month wait between something that's verbal and a written. That's an excellent question. <laughs> like, I don't understand. I don't think there's a timeline. I don't think there's, I don't think anywhere in the legislation is there a timeline that says a tribun tribunal judge or whatever their, their yeah. term is, tribunal leader, um, has to complete the paperwork within a certain period of time. It's the same with the minister's zoning orders. Yeah. So this, this Cummer uh, modular site, uh, the city asked for a minister's zoning order there over 800 days ago. Um, and But there's no requirement even when that minister's zoning order request goes from the city to the minister, there's no requirement the minister responds in any way within a certain period of time. All right. And that's, so unless you hold a stopwatch, they can yeah. sit on that request as long as they want. They can sit on this ruling as long as they want. Uh, the city cannot proceed until somebody puts it down in writing. Right. And as we're waiting, construction costs are increasing. Yeah, absolutely. Interest rates are increasing. Um, everything is, is impacting our ability to actually deliver those affordable housing units on that site. Like the, the, the Cummer site, the Cummer Willowdale modular is an absolute example of just political cowardice end to end. And it's almost all at the provincial level. Um, cause the province had the power to fix this and for local political reasons, cause it's a swing seat between liberals and conservatives at the provincial level. They were listening to the loudest, crankiest neighbors because right. they're the most motivated voters. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think that what we see is there's so many layers of complexity and what we need is more efficiency. More simplicity. <laughs> I would simplicity. say less, 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 than, less than efficiency. Yeah. We need simplicity. We, it, we talk about landmines. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like going into a war zone afterwards and, yeah. you know, digging the landmines up yeah. one at a time. You need to do it carefully. Yeah. But you need to make this back into a farmer's field again, right? You need yeah. to make it something where kids can safely walk to school again. And you have to do that by getting rid of the stuff that you had shoved into the ground for the last 30 years. Yeah. And I mean, okay, so if, if there were takeaways, the average person, what can they do to be supportive? You, you show, show up. Show up. Show up, okay. speak up and be public about it. Don't be afraid of your neighbor. Cranky Bob at the end of the block is just one guy. Yeah. And, you know, maybe your kids won't get invited to the birthday party, but your kids will have new neighbors and people moving into the new building that they can make friends with. Yeah. Um, we see this to a lot of people who, who help us out and at, both at Housing Now and some of the other YIMBY, Yes in My Backyard organizations. Your superpower is showing up. Mm. You know, and sometimes it means you need to be in a community center at seven o'clock on a Tuesday night or in a church basement or wherever the city happens to be holding the meetings. Yeah. The, the city is fine tuned to listen to the people who show up at those meetings. And the people who have traditionally shown up for the last 30 or 40 years are the people who are there to say no and go slow. Yeah. And we need somebody to say yes and go faster. Yeah. 
and you need to speak to your local councillors, um, your local city planners when these projects come up and speak to your neighbours too. Yeah. Your neighbors often have that kind of visceral reaction, right? Oh, there's a new thing happening in my neighborhood and the new thing must be a bad thing. You live in a growing city. Yeah. If you want to live in Niagara on the Lake, go and live in Niagara on the Lake. Yeah. But if you want to live in a growing city and you want to be near hospitals and universities and shopping malls and, you know, all of the things that the opera and theaters and all the things that a growing city has to offer, your trade off for that is putting up with other people. Yeah. And new people who want the same things that you want. Yeah. I mean, so what's your call to action? I think it is, it is showing up, showing Just up and showing speaking up. up, showing up and speaking up in support is the, is the biggest thing that you can do. Um, particularly around affordable housing projects. There's a lot of stigma just around the word affordable housing. Uh, you'll sometimes hear affordable, attainable, workforce housing, like different words put around it um, because they're, you know, poverty isn't catching. And not everybody we're creating affordable housing for is poor now. Yeah. You know, workforce housing is for people who are making upwards of seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. A Habitat for Humanity, you now qualify for a Habitat for Humanity affordable ownership unit up to, I think, $120,000 in household income. Yeah. Ten years ago, it was about 60000 Yeah. Like, as, as the longer we wait, the more things get expensive and the more the, um, the, the housing crisis moves up the income ladder. Absolutely. I mean, like you hear about the where is the middle class? There is no more middle yep. class. It's a divide between the haves and have nots. Right. I mean, I work in housing and I see it. I see how difficult it is to get, a, like you said, a basement apartment that you rented for six hundred dollars. Yep. Indexed inflation would be nine hundred. I mean, the reality is there are good people out there doing like frontline work um, who cannot afford even a basement apartment. Yeah, 100%. So, I mean, the average income in the city of Toronto, household income is about $84,000. Yeah. Um, and that means that you can afford up to about $2,000 a month in rent. Yeah. Uh, you can't really find a place. I think most, most places now are $2,500, $2,600 a month. A, th a brand new build three-bedroom apartment is renting for four, yeah, $4 nice. a square foot. So, you know, 900 Square feet is renting for thirty eight, thirty nine hundred dollars, yep. um, and that's not downtown in city place yep. or somewhere. That's likely further out into like Eglinton Golden Mile or somewhere <laughs> like that. Yeah, I mean, and you're farther away from like work or transportation yep. and all of those things that are, help create a better quality of life that everybody wants, right? Like, and especially if someone is working at a lower income range or an entry level, most people don't have cars. Yeah. It, it, and if you have a car, then the cost of parking and travel and gas is creating another burden upon you. So, you know, we do tend to shove, we're shoving people further and further away from transit. Yeah. And they're, they may have a lower housing cost because of that. But if you take the combination of housing and transit together, yeah. the pain points are the same. Yeah. You know, drive until you qualify doesn't make sense if you work in a factory where you have to be there at seven o'clock in the morning and it's a particular, you know, yeah. location you have to be at. Driving until you qualify might work if you're working white collar jobs, but not if you need to be in the hospital, in the factory, in yeah. the hotel, wherever it is that you physically work. No, and that, and I think those are really key things that people have to remember, yeah. right? And then it's not pushing things out. So on your wish list of things to accomplish for the next year, what would that be top of your list? Getting clarity around provincial and federal lands so that they were being handled more like the Housing Now sites, accelerating all of these programs and having the province and the feds come back into uh, a program that funds affordable housing in a substantial way. Yeah. Uh, and, and by substantial, I do mean billions of dollars, whether that's federal money itself or they create some kinds of social housing bonds that Bay Street and the pension funds can invest into. But we need 30 year money. So 30 year construction loans and we need them at under three percent and they need to be <laughs> locked for that period of time. So the spread right now on that is two and a half or three percent. So the feds can either buy it down or the province could insure them or there's yeah. some model there 
But unless we're back in the business of super low interest, long-term loans for affordable housing construction, um, and you know, the feds, I don't think, have $36 billion to throw just at Toronto. So they're going to have to come up with mechanisms that make it an attractive investment for the banks, the insurance companies, the pension funds. Yeah. I mean, you talk about interest rates and having a long, short-term, low-level yep. interest rates. But the reality is we're in a climate where interest rates 6 7%. Yeah, and so in the affordable housing world, there's usually a little bit of a buy down through CMHC, mm -hmm. which was great when interest rates were under 2% when you could get a 1% construction loan. But that money was also only for 10 years. Yeah, They need the stability to basically for the entire life of the construction loan and right. the mortgage on that building if you're a not-for-profit. They need to know from the day they start construction until 30 years from now that they have a stable model for writing down that long-term mortgage, which is essentially exactly what the programs were in the 1990s and the 1980s yeah. that were, you know, canceled. Uh, BC Housing exists, right? BC Housing is kind of like CMHC for British Columbia. There's yeah. no equivalent to that in Ontario. No. Um, and the, the fact that they're, as Canada's largest province, we do not have an infrastructure bank for affordable housing the way that BC does is puts us at a, a huge disadvantage. This is a lot of long-term planning and the incentive for people at decision-making tables to say, okay, we do need to do that, right? Yeah. And I know you have been making recommendations when you meet with councillors, like municipal, federal, provincial, and advocating for that. Yeah, we've had. I mean, we've been very lucky that we've we've met with Minister Calandra, who's the new yeah. provincial minister. We've met with Minister Fraser, who's the new federal minister. Uh, we regularly meet with people at Toronto City Hall, and we occasionally get phone calls from other city halls yeah, going, yeah, yeah, yeah. "What are you guys asking for exactly?" Because maybe we should do that here too. Yeah. Um, I think because we are nonpartisan, yeah, and we're also data nerds and numbers nerds, we come from a civic tech and open data space. We're just trying to, like, it's a victory for us if everybody is using the same numbers. If everybody understands what an affordable housing unit actually costs to build now yeah. in Toronto, if everybody understands what the value of a GO station parking lot or a TTC station parking lot is, yeah. then that helps have an informed conversation. And, you know, we're, these projects are going to take decades, the 30-year construction loans, right, for these projects. So we need to talk to all levels of government. We also need to talk to all of the political parties because yeah. over the course of a redevelopment of, say, the Ontario uh, Portlands down yeah. here, right, the Portlands is going to be a 20-year model. I'm going to have ministers and MPPs and prime ministers and premiers from different political parties over that 25 years. Absolutely. So... It's not about playing politics. It's about making sure that everybody has the same baseline, baseline information. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. Like, and I love, I mean, having information, having the same data facts, like making sure that that's available, making sure that there's a continuity of long-term planning. And, and that's a part of the secret sauce for affordability, right? Yes, like, 100%. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, I always... You know, one of the things that you said that's really important, your main call to action, show up. Show up and speak up. Show up and speak up. Yeah. So I think that's something that is an important takeaway because it impacts us all, right? It's a quality of life. Um, usually when I bring and, you know, close to an interview, I always ask for a favorite quote. And I love the quote that you have here, which is um, from Apollo 13. We've got to find a way to make this fit into the hole made for this using nothing but that. Yeah. So you might remember that it's, you know, astronauts are on the way to the moon. Something explodes. They're no longer going to be able to make it to the moon. They suddenly realize that the ship isn't designed for everybody to have enough oxygen to survive because they were expecting for part of it, they were going to separate and half of them are going to be down on the moon in their <laughs> spacesuits. So now they have to figure out a way to make the ship a lifeboat. Yeah. For an extra couple of days. Um, and there's a bunch of engineers who get pulled into a room and they have to make the scrubbers work to, to make sure that there's enough clean air and oxygen and carbon uh, dioxide is removed. 
using only the tools that are actually on that spaceship. Yeah. So we use that as an analogy. We get a lot of politicians and even a lot of other affordable housing activists who are looking for this amazing change. Like, you know, what if we just got rid of capitalism? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, that's, that's great. Good for you. But that's actually not one of the options that's on the table now. Yeah. We, we dump out all of the government policies, all of the government programs that are on the table, and we need to make housing out of the bag of options, the dim sum menu or buffet yeah. of options that are on the table. We may be able to tweak them a little bit. We may be able to duct tape a couple of them together to make them work better. But in many cases, we're not going to substantially change them fast enough to deliver the affordable housing. It's true. So it's, it's about everybody being more innovative and adaptive and flexible and not writing rules like we talked about earlier that are putting landmines in your way. Yeah, those landmines have to be removed in yeah. order for us to move forward. And that sometimes hindsight is twenty twenty, right? But now moving forward, we don't have we've got to address that. Oh yeah. If I if I had a time machine and I could go back into the past and just be able to say to like city council or other levels of government, but what if you do want to get back into the affordable housing business again? That would have been a huge change in just the way every one of those bits of legislation was written. Yeah. That people wrote legislation without even ever considering you'd want to get back into the business. I mean, this is something that's so important in terms of the policymakers. Like, why is it important to have government officials who understand what are the priorities or listening and willing to say, okay, actually, our legislation is like limiting the growth and going back to change it. I mean, and we've, we've had success. Yeah. Parking minimums went away, but we had to shine a very bright spotlight. We had yeah. to have a bunch of fights with counselors who we now don't fight with anymore. Yeah. Because the math was the math. Yeah. Right. Like it's very transparent. It's like very transparent. The data. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's one of the things you're like, we're taking away the jargon. We're just looking at the numbers and the stats. So, so to taking away the jargon, one of the things that we purposely do in all of our work is yes, we do you know, larger reports with U of T School of Cities, with Toronto Metropolitan University, but our communication style in our pub, most of our public com, uh, communications is aimed at a grade four, five, or six student doing their social studies homework. Wow. And the reason for that is we have lots of different languages in the city of Toronto. People have a finite amount of time to read a document or read a newspaper. Yeah. If you're communicating with somebody through the media and you've got 90 seconds or two minutes yep. on CP24 or City News, they don't want to hear your professorial treatises yeah. on affordable housing. They want to know the, like you said, the four facts or the three yeah. action items that they can act upon. So we've purposely created our content so that that is available at a grade four, five or six student level of comprehension. Um, and I think if more advocacy organizations did that, they would have more success in changing the public discourse. Smart words, wise words, time for change. Yes, constant time for change. And and the, cha the change is going to be constant. And like going to the gym, the first couple of months of the changes are going to be painful. Yeah, it's not you, 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 you got you to do things that are outside of your comfort zone, and you need to do them one after the other. It, it's going to hurt a little bit politically, uh, on, on the tax base, it's going to hurt a little bit, but we can't keep going the way we've been going. A hundred percent. Thanks so much for your time, Mark. Thanks for having me. Thanks for checking out this episode. You want to make sure to like, subscribe, and share so that you don't miss out on the next In Focus episode on topics that matter to you.